Hello. 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 Does my audio work? Yes, it does. Hi. We can hear you. See you. <laughs> we can barely see ourselves. It's really, really small. So. <laughs> Well, you are reasonably large. So, <laughs> screen, everybody. This was not to be interpreted uh, in a way you did. <laughs> Thank you, Carsten. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, <clears throat> we have been working on the uh, whiteboard. So, we're just thinking that we can just zoom in and let, let you see. Oh, that, that's really bad compression artifacts. It's going to get better. Yeah, when you zoom in, it gets better. Barely see, but why can I, can I not do this bigger? I mean, well, this is going to make it minimized, yeah. It was here. So, if I knew where the chat window is today, it's gone in my... The chat? The chat is gone. You should get something. Oh, ah, there it is. So this is the Etherpad we're using today. <clears throat> and we, we haven't really bashed the agenda yet. Maybe we'll spend some time discussing the uh, output of your workshop. Yep. How much time do you think we should use for that? As much as we have, I guess. <laughs> as much as we have. So, okay. <laughs> but maybe it's not a good idea to start with that. Maybe you can take the rest of the items and then uh, but some of us have to leave in one hour, right? So right, we have okay, to. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, but also for me, it would be helpful if we could have that power. Okay, Ivailu, can you say something about the CoCon status? Yeah, I think it could be a good thing. <laughs> so, okay, so let's do this before we enter the big thing. This like five minutes or ten minutes? Yeah, I think five minutes should be enough. Okay. Think we're not going to do pub sub then? Do we have a pub sub authors online apart from? Are you officially or not? I'm not yet an author. No. Okay. Okay. We don't have PubSub authors then. The one sentence status update is we still need to put the PubSub proposal into the actual draft. Mm. Okay. Okay. Okay, anything else we want to add to the agenda? Okay, I hope everybody is seeing the Etherpad I'm typing into. Should I share that? Oh, we can we can see it. Okay. Good. Um, so let's do a quick document status. 
uh, right now we have one document in the RFC editor queue, and it looks like it will stay there for a while because the RFC editor queue is pretty full at the moment. Uh, we have uh, Samuel Edge, uh, which I think is waiting for the authors. Um, actually, Ari told me that he won't be able to make it today, so I probably should add him here in the list of apologies. So here we are waiting for the authors. Hoplimit has been quite active, and, and there is a Dash 07 upcoming uh, with uh, all the, the good ISG uh, input. And um, maybe we can do a quick run through that uh, after the document status. Uh, Senem Elmore Units is uh, entering IETF last call now. Um, so, uh, Alexei was very quick in, in his AD evaluation. The resource directory is still in AD evaluation. Uh, for echo request tag, we are waiting for a new version that addresses uh, Francesca's review comments. And uh, for stateless, I think uh, dash O2 with uh, that is addressing the W. G C comments is upcoming. So that that uh, finishes my part of the document status. Any other document we want to talk about? Okay. So let let's go to the hop limit document. We we already discussed that we are uh, comfortable with uh, making the requirement to implement a uh, hop limit into a must. Uh, the current text says a must for new implementations. I'm not sure that that's actually actionable, uh, but I think it, it does uh, uh, express the intent uh, here. Um, so uh, I probably should be pasting in the link to the 07 yes. version. Mohammed has his own repository somewhere. Yeah, so th there was one point, uh, Klaus, you have a CC on that, um, where um, the, the current text doesn't really explain how implementations that uh, do not implement hop limit uh, handle the cache versus implementations that do implement uh, hop limit handle the cache. I mean, it says how, but it doesn't say why. Um, so maybe we want to add some text there. But apart from that, um, I think we are in pretty good uh, shape. And um, here's a pointer to the uh, GitHub repository that uh, Matt uses for doing the work. He doesn't do this exactly the way we usually use a GitHub, but still there, there is a candidate uh, dash or seven uh, there, and uh, maybe uh, it's good if, if people who are interested in the hop limit uh, thing have a look uh, there. So that's my current uh, status. I don't know who has followed the uh, various ISG comments. I think there have been some pretty good editorial uh, comments uh, and the, the usual uh, comments we get uh, when, when people aren't part of the co-op ecosystem and, and don't know how to read the, the tables with the C and U and R bits uh, and, and things like that.
Anything else on top limit? So if, if there's anything we, we should uh, push back on, we need to know this pretty quickly because tomorrow is uh, going to be uh, uh, the telechat and uh, it might get improved there as it is. Okay, so with that, let's go on to the uh, CallConf status. Yvonne, can you say a few words? So yes, we uploaded new version of the Comi draft, uh, which addresses some of the, I think, all of the review comments that we had for that uh, draft. So uh, the most notable changes are uh, the examples. They were having a plus sign, which was confusing for readers. So now we uh, removed uh, the plus signs. Uh, and uh, I believe this should make it more obvious to follow. And another, maybe more uh, important change is that before we were always referring as slash C as the uh, resource that needs to be used. Now, this is something that it's more clear that it could be changed, but uh, by default, it is uh, slash C. So for me, those are the most important changes, and I think they address all the uh, comment that we had for the draft and um, otherwise there are a few editorial changes as well uh, and for the rest of the drafts uh, I think um, they were already uh, revised around the end of the last ITF um, I think that they are also, uh, all the review comments are addressed. Um, so yes, I am not aware of any additional uh, changes that are requested for the core conf drafts. Okay, so this means uh, we should be going into working with Blast Call over the set. Yes, I think it's, uh, it's the logical next thing to do. Okay, any other opinions on this? Okay, so I think that the chairs will have one last look, uh, but we should be able to issue the working class call soon, and <clears throat> should even be able to to have a result uh, in time for for the internet draft deadline on uh, November fourth. Okay, thank you. So with that, uh, let's. Go on to the results of your workshop. Yes. Um, can you see our uh, whiteboard? Is yes. that like, readable? Okay. We also have slides. Um, maybe we should start with those. Yeah. Take this one. Uh, uh, Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, we have been discussing for the whole day since nine this morning. It's uh, me, Klaus, Rikard, Marco, and Christian. Um, there are some minutes in the ether, etherpad here. Um, yeah, you cannot click the link, but 
Yeah, but we'll, uh, we have been drawing on the whiteboard mostly, so we have, um, yeah, we try to summarize the discussion. Um, so we talked about two documents. Can you and quickly show the URL again? Our no, okay. Previous slide. Previous slide. The third slide. Yeah. Thank you. It notes ITF workshop 16, 10, 19. I don't know why Cora is not is not in there, but yeah. Um. Okay. So the first thing we discussed was the multicast for notifications. So this started, if you remember, with a, a hallway discussion about uh, about PubSub and how to get multicast for notification working. There were several proposals, and one of these was to get um, multicast working for responses. And this is the draft uh, that Marco has brought to core, which is draft Tiloka for observe notifications multicast uh, observe multicast notifications yeah so just um, we have gone through it and we have clarified what so if you remember that draft suggested uh, to reserve ranges of tokens for these specific applications and when we presented that at the ETF, we got some very skeptical faces, particularly from Klaus and Kasten. And so we had this uh, this workshop to make sure that, okay, can we not do it in another way slash better? And I think we figured out a better way to do it. And this picture or the whiteboard is supposed to explain that. So let, let's go through it. Can you see my uh, mouse pointer? Yes. Great. Should we just show it on the whiteboard with our like, physically hands? If, if you want to do that, um, it's fun. I mean, we, I can we barely about see what. This, who actually wants to go through the thing? And so I can give it a try, and then whatever you. <laughs> I, I give it the pedagogical way, and if you want to give it the theoretical way, which is nice, but yeah, they, you can explain it in different ways, I think, <laughs> right? Just yeah. to make you understand what the message flow is. So, and, and in the end, we actually didn't change that much, but mostly we clarified how we described the whole thing. Yes. And that made it made, made the biggest advance. Yeah. So, so, the 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 biggest thing or the first thing we did is so you have these uh, these boxes up here. The top box is the server, and the bottom box is the client. So you can see that there is only one endpoint in the server, the smaller box, this one. But the the client uh, actually has two different endpoints. So the co-op endpoints are different because one of them uses the unicast IP and the other one uses the multicast IP. Multicast IP is yeah, the multicast address that the client is uh, listening on for multi multicast notification. Um, so how does it work? The client first sends a request to the server and this request is to indicate that it it intends to observe a certain resource. Uh, then the server responds to this request uh, saying, yes, okay, but uh, you actually need to listen to this IP address and, um, um, and also sending other information like, okay, this is, here it is, the token that you will need to match these responses. Uh, and possibly other thing like group of score information. Um, the client then uses this information, that is five, in its other endpoint, which is the multicast one, where 
it will listen to responses that match the request that the server sent to him in four. So basically, the, four, uh, the server is telling the client, I am going to respond as if you sent me this request. And the request is the, this little box here. And the client is not actually sending this request. So this is a, a what, what do we call this? Either fake or a virtual. virtual request that the, the client is not sending. And the server is actually responding to this request using the token um, phantom request. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> Michael just suggested phantom request. Token. <laughs> multicast IP address, everything. Um, and any other notification will be received on this, on this, uh, as, as, yeah, matching this phantom request. So, um, yeah, does it make sense? We need to clarify. Which number, which number is the phantom request? Phantom request is number one. Okay. So the point is that assuming that this is not the first client that requests, that wants to do this observation, that wants to do this uh, multicast, want to, wants to do this observe over multicast, um, then uh, the, the, the server has already set up has already a multicast IP address set up. It has already like multicasting notification to other clients. And it's basically just telling the client, you need to, you need to listen as if you sent me this request. So who, who owns the token namespace? Technically, the owner is the multicast IP address. Right. But since there is no single entity behind that, um, we delegate this task to the server. And actually, it turns out that we don't need to reserve any token spaces or anything like that, because when a response receive, is received by the client at, the, at this multi cast IP endpoint, then uh, in this um, uh, scope of client endpoint and server endpoint, the server chosen token uh, can be chosen by the server without any ambiguity. So, so we, just to... It might help in understanding this, that the phantom request was a unicast message. So whenever the message comes back, um, it only needs to be matched against the tokens uh, from the, uh, the tokens with that particular IP address as a server. Yeah. Um. Uh, during the discussion, we also realized that the um, reserving or whatever the token value ranges wasn't needed uh, in the first approach either. Uh, but while in the first approach we were using co-op options to give information back to the client, now we are essentially using the payload of that message for. So no need for new co-op options anymore either. Yeah, we can go into details of that. I have. And the next slide will say that. But basically, just to recap, why did we have token ranges before? We had token ranges because we did not do this distinction between the co-op cli client co-op endpoints. And we saw that the situation we were worried about was, OK, what if a client has, um, has used this token to send a unicast request to the server? And it's waiting for a response on that token. And then suddenly, the same server uh, is telling the same client that you should listen for this same token. So the client would, would, 
would be waiting on two uh, responses with the same token and wouldn't, wouldn't be able to differentiate between them. But now with the discussion with Klaus, with, and we realized that um, that is not possible because the co-op co endpoint is also identified not only by, um, it's identified by its IP address and port. And the other definition, no, that's it. So uh, IP address and port. So if, if it's using a unicast IP address, the endpoint is going to be different if, if it's using a multicast IP address. Yeah, I think we, <clears throat> in, in earlier discussions, we may have been confused because for requests to a multicast address, we need to uh, relax the, the matching rule so that the response that comes from a unicast address matches the, the request that went to a multicast address. Um, but in this direction, we don't have to relax anything. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I agree that that this should uh, generally work. Yeah. But that part about to token ranges is removed. Yeah. Um, options are removed. So let's maybe let's talk about if that if this sounds clear, then we can talk about what still needs to be defined, which is the more interesting part. I, I have one more question on this picture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, the whole thing only makes sense if you have more than one client. Mm -hmm. um, so how does message number five get to those other clients? So uh, this message number five is inside this one client. Yes. Another client is wanting to list me. It's going to do the same thing. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to request. It's going to do the same request to the server. It's going to get this message four that will contain this same information. Phantom request, more or less. The phantom yeah. request, yeah. And then the client itself will, it will have to do with the exact same thing. So so this, this uh, phantom request information, however that's formatted, um, will be uh, sent by the server to the client every cli for every client that wants to the wants to observe this multicast, yeah, resource. I don't know how to call it multicast resource and so on. Okay, so the, the um, if you have a large uh, group of clients that that want to listen to these notifications, uh, then maybe you don't want to to um, imply the server into each join, each client join. Uh, but maybe you can model this as a proxy thing. I haven't thought about this. Yes. yes. Like, Christian, was also, yeah. Christian was also suggesting that uh, this uh, request three and four may not be done at the same, um, to the same server that contains or that has the observable resource. This might be another, this might be another uh, server. Another endpoint, yeah. We were also discussing if three is even in get observe. Yeah, so let's move to this. Oh, okay, you have to. Yeah, this, that in, in this slide. Um, so we have several details that are not fine, and we would like your opinion, if you have ideas, anything. Um, the first one is, about request three. So this is the way that the client tells the server, hey, I want to uh, observe this resource. Um, how, how does it say that? It could, be, it could be a get to a separate resource, which can be well-known slash the resource to observe. It could be a observe to that exact resource. So there are different ways. And, and the response, the same way, could be either uh, um, 205, and the content of the response can be, like the payload of the co-op response can be, this is 
the request that I'm going to match to. This is the phantom request. Or if you're using observe to directly to the resource, it could be an error, error response saying, hey, I'm not going to, um, I'm not, this is not going to end up in an observation, but here is the information for you to actually observe via multicast. Yeah, a related question is uh, when does the server know that the last client is gone? That, that's the usual problem in multicast solutions. Um, yes, but then again, it can it could do what it usually does. Um, what is usually done in observations to just send a con back. And yes, we are ruling that out in seven two five two. And again. Um, this is, we are ruling out multicast responses at all. So, yeah. so the server should occasionally send a confirmable response. Let's see if anyone's out there. Confirmable response. I don't, I don't think that makes any sense. So I didn't understand what the con is about. The multicast notification should be non-confirmable. Right, that's what I thought. So, so how do you find out if there are no, if there are any clients left? It's hard to hear you, Michael. Well, you need to do the power break thing again. Um, so there's uh, there there would that be also another option. That is to um, to just let the topic uh, let the notifications expire in the sense of not sending something uh, for for longer than the max age, and then waiting whether someone is asking for the for the observation data again. But that's just a new jerk correction. And in a completely different direction, one thought we had was, what if the server actually starts sending uh, the multicast notifications before it even has heard from the first client? It just sits there, and whenever it wants to send some notification, it does it. And um, then you can, uh, independently from that, spread the information how to listen to those notifications. Mm -hmm. And then clients can start doing that, and they can stop doing that, and yeah. the server is completely so this, unaware. This is this was about the bullet number three was about that, which is if the server configured before to what this is what you were describing configured before to send this notification to the this multicast address and just shares that uh, information to the clients that wants to uh, observe that resource, or can decide to um, to to start sending notifications on multicast when it realizes, okay, I have a certain number of clients that are all, all listening to this, um, all listening to this um, re observation. Um, should I then switch to multicast? There are different ways, and they are not exclusive. They could be. There are options. Like I think, I personally think that they both make a lot of sense, and they should be described. And um, I don't see a problem with them coexisting. This is something like, yeah, whoever deploys this would have to decide how how do I make this work? Do I does the server always send a multicast, or does it start sending a multicast if it has too many clients? Can I support that? And I saw it, something from Michael, but... Hi. Is this better? Is that annoying? No? I think if you talk loudly, it can work. Yeah, I'm in a some, some more public room, so I'm kind of trying to keep my voice down, but um, I unplugged the power supply to use battery. Um, <clears throat> so I guess... I guess I guess one thing I wanted to ask before I was trying to read some of the documents before we before this goes too far. Um, 
Uh, does someone have a, a real practical use for this today? Um, and the reason I ask is because a lot of LLMs, you know, support multicast with great difficulty. And so it may not be a big win to use multicast anyway. Um, and so while I think this is pretty cool, I, I think that it would be better if it was well motivated with a, um, a, a, a a brick and mortar use case that really demanded it rather than just this cool we could do this. Mm -hmm. I think the the use case that um, has always been named for actually using multicast not just the group communication use case, but the multicast use case uh, has been switching lights. Uh, so uh, you can um, have them all switch on and off at the same time. Uh, of course, that, that only works if the no packets are lost uh, and so on. Uh, so here the, the uh, lights would be the clients and they, they um, uh, subscribe to a multicast from a, a light switch or from a controller, and the controller can send out uh, multicasts to to uh, do the light switch. And then, of course, you have to do all the multicast things like saturation uh, and so on to make sure that that things actually arrive. So essentially, message three is um, for the light bulb to find out um, what is the the multicast address and and the token um, that that has the right uh, information for this light switch, and of course this could also be configured. It, it, it wouldn't have to be a, um, a request, uh, but it also could be a request. Um. Yep, I think we yeah. have a draft on that, Carsten. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was yeah that was the first bullet. What the request? Or what if request? And the second bullet is what response? Because that's that's about four. How how do you get this information and what information exactly? Because here we we were saying we are thinking okay what what is this? it's not not only the token is request one including the token um, it might be the multicast IP address that was something that in the previous version of the draft we uh, moved out. So it was there in the beginning and when we, we moved it out because we, we saw, okay, this is negotiation multicast type address seems too complicated, but in this case, maybe it's, I think it makes sense yeah. to put it in. Um, yeah, it's for example, request one includes, for example, the request URI or the options in the request. And then for security, it would be necessary to have the OSCORE, if OSCORE is used, group OSCORE external AAD. So this is the AAD that is external AAD that is used in two in the response in all the notifications that are linked to the registration request. Um, and since yeah, that does not that is not sent. The server is telling, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna 
link all the notifications to that. So right now we see this we see this um, information, how that is formatted exactly. We don't really know. First, we were thinking of literally putting the core wire format into inside the payload of, of response four, and which is what's happening. In and then we were thinking uh, maybe not, uh, and doing something nice uh, based on CBOR instead. And then we were thinking, uh, but what if uh, request one uh, is actually protected by OSCOR and um, so, um, then taking out the information would break the OSCOR protection of that information. Mm. So then we were back at uh, maybe literally transferring the OSCOR protected request one in, inside this payload of number yeah. four. Mm -hmm. Has to be a group of score protected requests in case, right? And that would mean having the LED part already embedded in the message right away, like the token. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But maybe we want to have some additional metadata. So we are back at having some kind of CBOR based format. <laughs> right. Where Wait, the core. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> it's a multi cast IP, for instance, would have to be. Yeah, so that now. is not part of yeah. the, yeah. So you want a kind of CBOR array with first element of metadata, then the message, of course. for instance. Yes. OK. What, what kind of metadata? Uh, for the multicast IP address. OK. So everything about the message. Um, if, we, if we model the phantom message to be an actual group of score message, probably the only metadata is the multicast IP address. For now, yes. For now, yeah. For now. Yeah. But but <laughs> uh, what about the um, so so if you think about OSCOR, group OSCOR, mm -hmm. there is the sender ID of one the of the phantom request. Yeah, but like uh, it's, it's like the, in the group sender, yeah. but you need to have the sender ID of the server. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you need the sequence number of the server that is used once and for all and consumed. Mm -hmm. And that would be also the partial IV in that phantom request. Yeah. So if you have an actual phantom request as a group of score request, you have, you have all the information, of information yeah, okay. there. Yes. Yeah, makes sense. And if you're not interested in group of score at all, so, so those group multicast notifications would be insecure. Well, so far so good. It's not a group of score phantom request. It's just a co-op mm -hmm. uh, phantom request. And well, just take it as is again. <clears throat> so I think I'm as not a even sure we should be defining the insecure. You'd like to mandate group of score user user no matter what. <laughs> I have no other idea how to secure multicast. Oh, me neither. But you, you may just want to have no security for some reason. <laughs> also, okay. the, the initial proposal had two parts separated, like without security first, and then we added security for the cases when, when you wanted it. I mean, that would be the same, right? You could define you could define it without considering OSCOR. You could define it how you do it. And then if OSCOR is used, it's really simple. Instead of having you send the co-op message, you send the OSCOR protected co-op message. It's yeah. like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So why, why provide the complicated insecure version when we already have a simple secure No, no it's, not, it's not complicated. It's exactly the same. It's just in one case, you send co-op. And in the other case, you send co-op that includes OSCOR, like uh, OSCOR protected co-op. Uh, Karsten, as an analogy, in 7390 and the beast we are building, uh, we are describing both the insecure case as a um, well starting point that we don't really recommend to go for unless you really know what you're doing, and then how to make it secure with group OSCOR. So I suppose we can think the same way here. I mean, it's it's basically not even different. It's the exact same yeah. thing. It's just that the co-op message contains the OSCOR option, so it's an yeah. OSCOR. 
And but, always keep in mind that the NO and NOSEC uh, is an acronym for security at the lower level. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm wondering if there are co -op, is co op over IPsec still a thing? That would be co op no sec mode. <laughs> it's in the RFC. Hmm. So, so um, at least some, there's a Daniel Migo who believes and seems to think that IPsec is useful in LLN. Um, and I I wish that were true, in which case you'd want, you'd want that mode. There's a placeholder we can really think of the multicast IP address followed by the phantom request that is. As an array, yeah, as an array elements. I would use a CBORO map and you know, the future option oh, okay. of extending stuff. Okay, yeah. yeah. And I would like to uh, do what uh, Christian suggested, which is for, for a format of three to just send uh, Observe to the resource, the resource uh, to observe, and then the server would send back an error with that payload, with the payload, with the CBOR array and all the information. So it observe to the actual resource to observe. Yeah, yeah. It would be like, yeah. The it would be is an error, but I'm offering you something better, and I explain you the payload. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, how we are suggesting doing yeah. redirect to application. To turn back an, uh, an error message with a with a payload that indicates what the application should do instead. Mm -hmm. This kind of rationale was at the very beginning of the previous version. Yeah. And we discarded it because no, this is confusing. Telling you no, but it's a yes. Yeah. No, <laughs> you cannot. No, you're not having a. But what we didn't realize is that it was it 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 is a no for this co-op endpoint. This co-op endpoint is not doing observation, but if the if this client supports this specification, then this client will know to start or to how to do the how to have this second co-op endpoint do the observation. So there is no observe option in response four. Okay. There is yeah no 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 observe. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Um, the only difficult question here is which response code are we going to use? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, good, good. Well, let's not have that discussion now because uh, there's not enough time in all the next interims. Bad uh, <laughs> <laughs> <That> request. <coughs> not yours, uh, the client. <laughs> yeah, we will have to decide that in Singapore over some beer, I think. Okay. Um, next. That, let me just mention that doing it this way it gives a natural solution for the proxy thing. Yeah. Because yeah. you can cache this error response. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, one thing is um, we were wondering how to get multicast through a proxy in, uh, in this number two notification. I think the conclusion was that you wouldn't. Uh, this is optimization of between two hops. And um, if there's a proxy between the client and the server, then you could do this multicast notifications on each hop from the client to the proxy yeah. and from the proxy to the server. But we wouldn't try to define any kind of end-to-end -end multicast through proxies. Yeah, sounds good. Um, maybe maybe one more thought here um, for the connection to another document that has been around in this context, that is um, the, the non-traditional responses. Um, so if you um, if you're aware of, of what what that document does, um, or just just to summarize briefly, that document says that we could put the request message in full into an option. And if we just replace that with, and by the way, for the request message, see there, then you could use the same things that we put in message four over there just again and have basically the same situation. So this is a response to what has been defined over there. Um, if you're really interested, you can look it up just to, to link those two things because they are very similar in, in some aspects. Yep.
Okay. Next. Um, yeah. So the next question that Klaus brought up was, does this work with the proposal for PubSub, which will be in the next version of PubSub? I understand correct. Um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> How did we get there? Um, so this uh, the figure on the right here is is PubSub with a distinction between configuration server and content broker. So there is the collection of the topic configuration, um, then configuration, and then the content, which can be on another on another node, and there are different ways, Klaus was saying, there are different ways of of distributing the notifications. The current way that is described in the current document is the one with um, a notification as responses, which is the one that we were we were considering for our multicast notification. And then other ways of doing that would be using co-op put or MQTT uh, publish and so so these right now are not defined but they will be and when we looked at this picture and we looked at to realize does this match with our multicast notification and the answer is yes you could still have a subscriber that has a unicast IP address it would reach for the configuration. Um, there is some, some something that needs to be defined there about how you do the discovery of where the topic is, what is the configuration, what are the different ways that you could actually uh, receive the notification. Um, but the point is that assuming that the topic uh, supports the the notification, multicast notification, then you can get the same response as number four over here. And then from this multicast IP endpoint, you can you can do the same thing. You can listen to the responses on the multicast IP that was um, that was told to you in 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 the say in the uh, response for. So the point is that it works, or it will work with the pub sub when the pub sub is updated. We don't see any problem with that. Yep, and then we would have to figure out um, a similar way to the previous slide. Um, how do we get this uh, information to the subscriber? Yeah. And um, since we are thinking about these uh, different ways of getting notifications to subscribers, like over MQTT and so on, there must be something defined in the PubSub proposal where you can get, uh, and here's how you get your notifications over MQTT. Here's how, how you get your notifications over multicast. Yeah. Here's how you can supply uh, a callback to your eye where the broker can put to, for example, and so yeah. all of these options could be offered by one PubSub broker, or just one of them. So what I was telling Klaus is that, and I would like to bring this up as a personal point of view, um, is that this is going to expand PubSub quite a lot. And I personally would suggest that the whole part about configuration and uh, topic configuration would be a separate document. Because what is right now in PubSub is basically this part, the part about the content broker and the subscriber, and only the part about responses as, as notifications. And it would be very simple to add uh, uh, notifications or as requests and MQTT publish, and they could even like be underspecified and 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 say like this can be done 
and you know someone else will do it and then have a separate document for the configuration with all the like API or interfaces that need to be defined how do you get the configuration how are these formatted and everything um, so my suggestion was that one then it's up to you to to uh, and to the working group to decide like what's the best way I, I definitely see that this it goes all together but mm -hmm. yeah um, and also of course that whatever however we format this message for we need to make sure that it fits with the interface on the configuration um, on top of configuration in the, in in that document when that will be specified the, the hope would be that we don't have to define two completely different formats here we we just use the same format and one is a subset of the other process mm -hmm. and yes we should uh, avoid the feature creep in the PubSub proposal and um, modularize it in some way with ex extension points so we can yeah. Yeah. extend it over time and I think that we should show this beautiful where is it beautiful right. figure that Klaus drew I don't know if you can see the whiteboard I don't know if you can see the screen share and the video camera at the same time in WebEx huh. maybe someone can confirm you can you just have to open up the right tab <clears throat> you can click the, the you can click the video or you can't what happened with that when you're talking i see your screen and when uh when francesca is talking you can see her screen if you do the right thing yeah so you probably have to unshare the powerpoint to see the screen to, to see the whiteboard okay let's see stop sharing you should pause no stop sharing yes <laughs> um, can you read anything for us? blood it is not really intended to be read but i can try to, to tell a bit about it um we have talked uh, ah. about the time in particular in montreal a lot about different um, components. We have resource directory and we have PubSub broker and, and so on. And one hope was, uh, or one observation was that these are all structurally very similar in some way. Um, most are building on some kind of collection resource pattern. And so we, we have all these different bits um, of small components. Uh, small pieces of components uh, in core and the hope would be that we could um, define them all in some kind of loose decoupled way and then simply arrange them and, co and combine them into these applications like uh, resource directory and software broker and so on and um, for example uh, collection resources is uh, the set on, on which data hub is based uh, and data hub is not, uh, much more than that and then we have um, in PubSub Broker the collection resource of configurations and in resource directory of collection resource of resource descriptions. And um, so we could actually use um, Data Hub um, to upload those configurations as an interface or those resource descriptions without defining anything specific to, to PubSub Broker and resource directory. But then we would need to define uh, for example, a resource discovery interface in addition to Data Hub so that clients can actually look up resources that they, that they are looking for. And when we uh, create topics, then publishers and subscribers need uh, some kind of topic discovery interface. And then uh, Francesca pointed out that aren't those two interfaces not really the same thing because topics are just resources. Um, and then we have these other parts like notifications via unicast, notifications via multicast, um, notifications via post callback, and so on. And that is not really specific uh, of notifications via MQTT. 
And that is not really specific to Foxtel Broker. It could be simply used um, by some device to uh, deliver telemetry to to, some, to the other devices or to the cloud also. Um, so we have lots of um, reusable parts here, I, I think. And um, <laughs> Francesca is taking photos of me. And um, the, the hope is that we can move those parts independently forward so they don't uh, block each other, uh, while at the same time getting synergies from aligning them with each other so that um, you don't have to do the whole thing again if you need the same thing in a different application. <coughs> yeah. And oh, Christian, Christian, Christian left, yeah. Yeah, I think that was cool. That was the first draft now. Yeah. Um uh, and before we move to the next, um I actually wanted to bring up that since we have been working on PubSub, um I and since we have the uh, one of the ace chairs in the meeting, hi Jim. Um, I think it will be time to adopt the PubSub um, profile because I I think we need to work on PubSub security at the same time as we work on PubSub. That's not unusual. That's not unreasonable. Okay, so I was hoping we could do an adoption call uh, before IETF 106. And I mean, even now I talk to people who were here and they are all supporting and I'm asking maybe like, okay, we're not that many today, but uh, please, if you think it's important, go to ACE mailing list and, and voice. So in the mailing list, Mark was trying to hide behind. Well, I was uh, <laughs> looking for my thumb. <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I guess that will come in the mailing list, right, Jim? Is Ericsson planning to do an implementation? Um, not that I'm aware, but I mean, yeah, implementation of sub sub security. Yes. I cannot commit to that. Ah, uh, okay, that's fine. But yeah, we'll see. I would uh, have to ask around. That's a possibility, but can say can say yes. Um, so from from the core side or on my side, um, I can say that. Uh, we probably need time until ITF 106 to put our proposal into a proper draft. Mm -hmm. And but once that is done, uh, at least I will loudly demand uh, security for PubSub, uh, which includes getting the payload securely from the publishers to the subscribers, uh, securing the uh, communication between the publishers and brokers and yeah. subscribers and uh, getting access control for the topic resources. Uh, if something is ready by then already, I, I would be very happy. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I, I will increase the pressure after ITF 106 probably to get that into place. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there is my draft and it's <laughs> answered this point. Um, well, I mean, part of, me is, part of me has basically been, no. Unless I see an advancement on PubSub, I'm not really all that interested in trying to advance PubSub security. So. Yeah. But hopefully now we will see advancement in PubSub. So, yeah. Okay. I just want to bring that up and ask for that. Um, and uh, by the way, since uh, PubSub is already a core working group document, we cannot really make uh, a dependency on Francesca's draft until it uh, has some kind of status mm. to move PubSub forward. So uh, please do this before ITF 106.
I mean, my, my draft is the only one that I'm aware of that has some type of proposal for securing PubSub. And even uh, MQTT people, when I talked to them, they were really happy and they were looking forward to uh, kind of synchronize to mm -hmm. adopt the same way to secure PubSub uh, in MQTT. So just like and this is a proposal for security, it doesn't have to be exactly that one. We can work on it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think we should work on it. Okay, so let me share my screen again. And we can move <clears throat> on with the slides. Um, so this is about the other the other document we talked about today, which is the group of core resource discovery. And um, this figure is just a recap of what this is. Um, so this is not my draft, but I can go through the slides <laughs> yeah. since I'm already doing that. <laughs> um, so um, so we have right now we have ACE for um, getting a client to get um, authorization um, to join a group and getting the keys from a group manager. And then we have in core the Oscar group com document to describe how to secure well both how to do group communication and how to secure group communication with OSCORE. And what this draft is doing is that it's providing a way for the client to find out um, where it can do the joining process. So to find out the group manager and the resource at the group manager that he needs to, needs to talk to. Um, so this would be step zero, and then the client would have the group manager uh, address and, and joint resource address, and it would try to get, probably either it knows what authorization server to talk to, or it would talk to the group manager, get back an error saying, hey, you need to talk to the authorization server, and then step one, talk to the authorization server, step two, get the keys from the group manager and post the token before it gets the keys. And then finally, it can run group of score, right? Part of the group. Quick recap. Was this uh, clear enough? Well, then I have an example too, or Marco has an example to go through. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is taken from the draft. It's one of the short examples. Uh, it's in two steps. Uh, the joining node knows only one thing, the name of the application group. So it has to find out the name of the security group, used to identify the score group, uh, the link to the join resource at the group manager, and the multicast IP address uh, used to communicate in the group. Uh, in order to do that, uh, mostly because of the way the resource directory works, uh, requires to perform two queries. Uh, this is the first one, uh, and this is actually new content brought uh, up by this document. So through this query, uh, the Johnny node gets uh, in the payload of the response, in fact, the link to the joint resource at the group manager. Uh, framed in red, uh, the name of that security group, uh, the name of the application group again, plus a number of things we define in the latest version of the draft actually, a number of parameters describing um, early in time uh, the algorithms and related parameters used uh, in the OSCOR group. That's something that the joining of node will end up knowing from the group manager eventually anyway. But knowing that so uh, in advance makes it possible to avoid a trial and error process with the group manager or um, an explicitly asking to the group manager upon access token posting like we described in the ACE uh, joining draft. 
Uh, also, in case in this response, the joining node gets indication of algorithms used in the Oscar group that the joining node doesn't support at all, it can just give up here and not continue with trying to get an access token uh, or whatever. So it's a hint, uh, but it spares possible later pain to the joining node. Uh, next slide. And this is the second query. Uh, it's something that we added in the examples of the draft for the sake of completeness, but uh, this is a pattern uh, taken from the resource directory document as is. You need to perform this second query, um, and this time it is an endpoint lookup, technically, where you indicate as an endpoint type a resource directory group, indicating as endpoint the name of the application group again. And the point of all this is that in the response you have indicated uh, in base the multicast IP address using the group. So up to this, uh, you're done with the resource directory and the flow continues with uh, going to the authorization server if you know it already or, well, to the group manager to get the unauthorized response pointing you at uh, the authorization server. But there are more examples in the draft, and there's a very long section with a real-world example that BACnet provided us. That was it. Yeah. I don't remember what was the next slide. But... No, next slide is uh, open point. All right. So if this is clear, then we were discussing um, the first point was that there is no register for link target attributes. Should we have one? Kind of a very open, hard question. So <clears throat> you are asking, should be, there be a register for link target attribute names? Um, we have two registries for target attributes, RT and IF. And you could always define another registry for, for a specific attribute. Yeah. But there is no... It's about the registry which contains the things like RT and so on. Yeah. So the, the, the new version, what's it called? 828H, forget the number. Uh, actually allows us to do that, so we, we could. The new version of? The web linking document. Ah, sure. I, yeah, I think we should. Because right now it's, um, yeah, it's a bit of a mess anywhere, everywhere, mm -hmm. and uh, it's even hard to know where to find all of them. And by the way, sec GP and up GP, well, there will be strings, the values they have depending on, on your particular applications and settings, of course, while for the other ones, we are not going to register any value for them. Values are going to be taken by the proper cozy registries and so on. It's just about the parameters themselves. Mm. Right. This um, link format was like the rock solid solution that we are convinced of is the right and best way to move forward for the foreseeable future, then I would be all in for creating this registry. But at least I'm trying to convince myself <laughs> of, I'm not convinced yet, but I'm trying to convince myself that uh, link format is nearing its end of life. And um, therefore, I have some reservation on spending too much time on blowing more life into link format. Um, but I, I'm not, I have no conclusions on this yet, where mm -hmm. my position actually is. But I mean, what would be the best way to, to the fastest and least painful way to do that? And possibly asking Karsten, principally, if we wanted to register the, this. Well, we would have to create a registry. Um, in a separate draft. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the question. Would probably be weird to to have it in this draft. <clears throat> would it, uh, would it have to be like core adopted or AD sponsored or what? It would it would be specifically for core, um, and uh, it it probably should be a working group uh, document. And I'm trying to find the space in A two A two eight eight that actually allows us to do this. <clears throat> because that that might A two eight eight says this specification does not attempt to coordinate the name of target attributes. Those creating and maintaining serializations should coordinate their target attributes and may define their own registries of target attributes. Yep, I, I think um, this registry is, is fully technically feasible with that wording. Um, it's mostly about how, how do we do this. Um, if, for example, your draft wants to register a bunch of new attributes, would you wait for a second draft that defines the registry if that progresses more slowly? Or why would it progress more slowly? Oh, I mean, it's it just wouldn't. yeah. Um, I can wait. It's just an Ayana. Uh, it's also Ayana possible that, um, I mean, we don't know if there are anyone out there who has their own link target attributes. And if we create a registry, maybe they register their attributes at some point, but likely not immediately. What we know of is all the attributes in RFCs and current drafts. Mm. So we can always keep a list in some wiki somewhere where we keep track of what we personally know of. And then anytime create that registry when, when we feel that the wiki is not good enough. So that would decouple the <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what Diana is for though. <laughs> like that's what Diana registries are, not to have these wikis. So. And so I guess you could create we, we also a draft now uh, already because yeah. I started it. Uh, we could also create a new draft and move that through core as fast as possible. I guess it would be like uh, introduction immediately followed by IANA consideration. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you just put in uh, the definition of the registry and the list of existing um, items and their references. And we, we could have uh, a working group last for next week. Um, but it, it's still some, some processing uh, time that is required with ISG review and all of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, again, I'm it's, fine, it's a dying. I'm fine thing, with that. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, but none of, none of what we are discussing now will be faster than creating this registry. Yeah, you yeah. mean like the uh, the group of core resource uh, discover resource discovery? I mean, it, it cannot go faster than this document anyway. <laughs> that would be absurd. <laughs> it cannot what cannot go faster. The, the the document for the IANA registry for the target attributes. Yeah, that could go faster. Uh, I, sorry, I meant the opposite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Can, can I hope it would. Yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it cannot. I uh, also have um, the plan to um, reorganize or, or refresh the definitions of all the existing core uh, registries that we have, the core parameters <coughs> registry. Um, that is not something that uh, can be done in within one week. Um, it requires a bit more thinking how we want to set up the registries, um, put more guidelines for designated experts. That's yeah. the main reason. Currently, we have too few guidelines for designated experts. And um, so, um, to avoid a flood of registry creating, updating uh, drafts, we could also say that um, this new registry here Can be part of is part of that effort. It's but fine. that would be moving more slowly than in standalone drafts. I think it's still very fine. Even so, I really think so. So <laughs> I'm waiting for a reaction from Karsten, but maybe he's thinking or disgusted. 
You never know. Well, all the direction I can give here is it, it's really easy to to define this target attribute registry, um, and I'm I'm all for moving small uh, documents. Uh, unless uh, we are doing something that actually does require coordination, and uh, I'm not sure that that would be actually the case here, uh, we do have to define the registry policy. And that, that will take a little bit of discussion, um, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's going to be very complicated. I mean, considering that now there is no, no registry at all, uh, even having a pretty relaxed policy for registering attributes will be fine, I guess. We're going from from not being able to register anything to uh, free for all is, is a pretty big step. Well, it's a, what I mean is it's already free for all. It's just like we don't have a place to track it. Now we would just yeah. have a place to track it. And isn't it already free for all in the sense that 8288 says that everybody can yeah, pick exactly. any name they want? That's what I meant. Okay, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's yeah. already free for all. So <laughs> it would be a more structured free for, free for all. Or there would be even, yeah. Anyway. You can always put a designated expert and, and then find out the rules for the designated expert later <laughs> on the fly on, on each, each case. Yeah. Mm. Okay, it can be done then, in principle. Yeah, so so what, who takes this? It's going to happen. I would be slightly in favor of doing this as part of the core parameters draft. Mm -hmm. um, there is no dependency between these registries, um, but I think it would make processing yeah. things easier, if even if a bit slower. So um, if that is uh, uh, an agreeable way of doing it, um, I would move this forward. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. OK, uh, yeah, then I had the next point, which is the next bullet point. I remember at the core meeting in Montreal, um, Jim proposed the possibility to have this document actually move to the ACE working group, because all in all, it's about advertising and discovering information that are useful in ACE, in fact. And I agree. And I remember Carsten be positive on this. Uh, though we started in core because this is about the resource directory that, that has core as its home. Uh, I'm fine with that. Uh, this has to happen. I wanted to check again because, of course, we are working on on an update uh, of this draft. And if that's something we can confirm uh, now or soon, we can submit that update to ACE right away. Otherwise, we continue in core. Yeah, I think that I'm, I'm, I think this could be done. Uh, I'm not yet entirely sure how much this is about resource directory and group manager as opposed to authorization server. It, uh, yeah, it has nothing to do with authorization yeah. server. This is only about finding out what group manager and what resource at the group manager to talk to. So it's the, very much. The, the train of thought is you want to find uh, an OSCOR group and its group manager, uh, meaning you want to find the link to the joint resource at, at the group manager. Uh, so you need to find links and descriptions. Uh, and it happens there's a way to do that efficiently in core and with the resource directory. So let's go for it. But it has nothing to do with any authentication or authorization process. That has to happen, of course, later on in ACE, in fact. I'm also wondering at this point, it may make more sense to stay in core because this may also be where you end up putting information about how to publish into a, into a resource directory the information you need for the multi, for the multicast observe. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, you mean adding the multicast IP address using the group uh, as a target attribute of the link to the joint resource? Potentially. Okay, we, we thought about that at the very beginning. Uh, we discarded that option, which resulted in that second query uh, we showed before, because we wanted to have the OSCOR group manager in principle agnostic of the multicast IP address used in the group, because it should care about key material all in all. And also because those multicast IP addresses is, are in fact associated with application groups, that have their own different ways of being registered in the resource directory. Right, but I'm, I'm thinking that that you're going to the 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 resource which is do which is broadcasting on the is a, a, returning the observe on the multicast may want to advertise both its resource group and its token. Okay, who does that be done then in the application group registration of the resource directory again? Could be. I don't know. Yeah. Sounds I, more I, natural. I, I haven't than... thought about it much. Okay. <laughs> but should we keep this in core then for the time being? I think so. Okay. I agree. Okay. Uh, and no matter what, I would keep the draft in core. I would not rename it to ACE. And um, then once it gets a working group document in core and or in ACE, um, that working group document would replace the draft in core. Okay. So that we, should happen in we, core we can anyway. Move the discussion where we think it's best. Right now it seems core is best. If we think uh, while discussing that ACE is a better place, we just Switch mailing lists without renaming the draft. Uh, by the way, a few meetings ago, it was raised by the chairs that before formally raising uh, adoption call, they should go to reviews, and there were a few promised reviewers. Uh, so yeah, we are waiting for those reviews. And otherwise, this is pretty advanced and close to be considered for for adoption actually. So we have four minutes, and the last point we did not discuss discuss at all during the workshop. How would this work in a coral based RD? And I don't think we have time to talk about it now. Um, it's something that we should definitely do, in my opinion. Uh, find out how it, it should be done. Um, if we want then to standardize this approach or not, it's a secondary question. Um, I'm not. 100% sure, but 100% uh, means a little bit. Um, but we should definitely do the exercise on, on finding out how it looks like if you use Corel and um, Corel Reef, for example. Okay. Yeah, which leads us to the last point of the agenda, which is what are we going to do two weeks from now? <laughs> and the, the, the one word that is at the top of the agenda is Corel. So maybe we can uh, add Coral RD plus group communication as a sub point here. The, the objective for Coral would be to close some of the GitHub issues before Singapore. Um, Unfortunately, most of those are not in the state where it's just uh, picking one of proposed solutions and then being done. Um, it's more coming up with those candidates uh, in the first place. Um, maybe it's a good idea to also have some design team meetings before and after the interim, and then use the interim to um, present candidate solutions to, to a larger audience. Hey, Christian, are you available? Christian is not here anymore. Oh. I 
I take the, the yes from Jim. <laughs> <laughs> My availability is going to be highly unknown. It will depend on what's happening on any given day. I would try to send the Google poll and find some dates. Yeah, my problem is I know what I'm doing tomorrow, today. Hey, Tim, what are you doing later today? <laughs> um, I am running four I'm tons of fruit as soon late, as I get to the wine rate. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so, Carsten, I just uh, um, uploaded the slides or proposed slides for today's. We just have to accept them. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, any other business? We cancel the interim in four weeks from now, right? Uh, have we actually said that? Um, but my notes are ambiguous on this. I will be in the air. Yeah, I will already have landed, but we will probably be sleeping. So, um, w w one interesting thing about uh, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, excuse me, Wednesday and Thursday, uh, 13th and 14th, um, W3C is not going to uh, meet in Singapore. We're going to have our workshop on the 15th. But we are not going to have a W3C uh, Web of Things meeting on the 13th and the 14th. Uh, people generally have had budget problems uh, adding another uh, meeting uh, uh, that late in the year. Uh, so th that is not going to happen. So uh, that's great because uh, those of us arriving early are going to have more time doing things like this. So maybe we can have a physical meeting on, on the 14th. Um, have you gone to, to get a room for the 15th yet? Um, I think Intel is still up for sponsoring that. Um, I'm going to have a discussion tomorrow to clarify this. So we, we are still looking at meeting in, in USS. Okay. So, um, yeah, it, it seems it doesn't make a lot of sense to have the, the actual interim meeting on the 13th. So do we decide to cancel this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.